Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19, Looking Ahead to Winter 2022-2023 and Beyond. I am Megan Paschal of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin. To learn more, please visit diasorin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Juliana Locasio, Director of Microbiology and Biology Laboratory, Department of Clinical Pathology at the Piacenza Ho Hospital in Italy. Juliana, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to present my uh, presentation here uh, about uh, COVID and uh, how we um, conduct our diagnosis and use of COVID tests in uh, Piacenza and what we are going to expect from uh, the next winter season. Um, I like to present my hospital is a, um, a hospital that it works in a very big area uh, is about uh, uh, 2000 uh, kilometers uh, um, square kilometers more than 2500 and uh, has got uh, 2087 uh, sorry, 287,000 inhabitants. It works on three hospitals, one main hospital, which is the one where I work, and two decentralized hospitals. Uh, we work in um, um, complete time, so we work 20 hours in uh, seven days, and uh, we had a uh, um, microbi microbiology and virology unit, uh, which uh, work on uh, bacteriology, infectious serology, mm, parasitology and mycology, and uh, now uh, also a big uh, um, part of molecular biology. We perform about 700,000 uh, tests for year. Um, why we are going here to speak about COVID? Because we know that uh, everybody knows that uh, during uh, the first uh, uh, month of 2020, uh, we find uh, new, a new pathology that is uh, the coronavirus disease 2019, uh, which caused a very uh, bad uh, uh, respiratory syndrome called COVID-19. And uh, it has gone to dominate the attention of many, uh, all the world, so clinicians, researchers, uh, and uh, uh, all the community. Uh, this was because uh, uh, COVID-19 represent uh, uh, the third uh, biggest uh, spillover of coronaviruses in the uh, uh, so tw last 20 uh, years. So this uh, enormous uh, impact uh, is uh, uh, it uh, involved all, all the world and uh, there was uh, just uh, um, an experience in 2003 with SARS-CoV, the first SARS-CoV infections and then in uh, 2012, uh, 2015 with Middle East respiratory syndromes. Uh, these uh, vi viruses uh, can spill over from uh, animals, uh, perhaps uh, um, there are ma many studies, uh, and on perhaps from bat to humans, and uh, has got a very fast rate of transmission. Um, in particular, this is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, 
this is the reason why many uh, patients has got these infections, also because uh, there was no existing uh, immunity for this virus. Um, in these two years, uh, we saw more than uh, 450 million cases uh, all the world and uh, more than 100 million cases were uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, this is a, vir a respiratory viruses that um, spread uh, in droplets, so by respiratory droplets, and uh, the symptoms uh, change over the time. So it starts with um, very bad uh, uh, pneumonia, interstitial pneumonia uh, disease, but it also presents with fever, cough or sore throat, and uh, uh, loss of smell and taste. Um, this is, um, as we, we know, uh, the outbreak of evolution from 2020 uh, since now, till now. And uh, um, as we can see, there are many, many countries involved. So all the globe was, um, was involved and uh, affected of this problem. This is the wave um, curve of uh, uh, the curve of the wave of the uh, outbreak in uh, Italy. And uh, as, uh, um, as you can uh, see, the first wave is a very little one, but started at the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic. So Italy was uh, not able to, uh, to make diagnosis as the other part of the world. Um, we have the first case uh, on the 31 of January 2020. And uh, as you can see, this is uh, the picture of uh, the different waves in uh, Piacenza, the hospital where I work, where the main and the, the worst uh, period was just at the beginning, because as you can see, you can find uh, you can uh, see that uh, in March 2020, almost all the bed of the hospital were full with COVID patients, so it was a nightmare. Now, uh, this is uh, the upgraded uh, um, situation, and uh, as you can see, the admission are really reduced uh, along all the wave uh, until now. The diagnostic, uh, uh, um, all, the, all the world uh, uh, make a very big effort to, to rapidly respond to these pandemic events. And uh, the, the effort was enormous. In a few weeks, uh, many testing approaches have been employed uh, related uh, on uh, local testing capacity. Also in Piacenza, we were not able to make so many uh, molecular testing uh, or other kind of, uh, uh, so a huge number of tests. And, um, uh, but diagnosis and uh, specifically uh, very rapid and early diagnosis was uh, the, the main uh, point uh, to permit, uh, to allow isolation of suspected patients, and uh, the way that the, the only way to control outbreak and prevent uh, extensive spread of the disease. Um, what uh, the, the laboratory testing was based uh, um, on uh, uh, symptomatic presentation of patients, but it uh, was also done on screening of asymptomatic people and also screening of a particular um, population that are healthcare workers. Uh, what are now looking on? We are, uh, there is a great concern uh, for next winter about the need to differentiate between um, COVID disease from a seasonal uh, flu that could uh, clog hospitals, emergency devices, and uh, uh, could also slow the diagnostic for 
patients with COVID because we know that uh, they are similar in presentation and uh, both COVID and uh, influenza viruses can cause uh, lung inflammation that could uh, um, give more susceptibility to other infections or other pathogens. What are the diagnostic tests uh, for COVID uh, uh, detect? Uh, we can uh, detect uh, the viruses, so the um, RNA detected by molecular test, uh, PCR, and uh, we can detect also the viral antigen uh, in a particular man many uh, different antigens, main or uh, the, the most uh, important one is the nucleocapsid antigen. Um, in the other way, we can uh, look at the immune response against COVID, so uh, how antibodies um, reach the, the presence. So if we can look at the um, IgM or IgG serology. And uh, this was the diagnostic approach that uh, was like a really uh, enormous puzzle. Uh, based on uh, clinical feature, but also on uh, laboratory testing, uh, on biological um, laboratory testing, and also on uh, imaging. But all the, uh, these uh, part of the diagnosis were not specific. So the uh, more specific diagnosis was, more, was made by uh, laboratory testing, in particular molecular biology, that was the gold standard. But uh, during the outbreak and the pandemic, uh, uh, some things was changed. So with the um, introduced, with the immunity uh, uh, on all the people, uh, some part of the diagnosis changed. So uh, now we look uh, uh, preferably um, more over on uh, clinical feature and uh, molec uh, we do all the lab tests uh, to make the diagnosis of COVID. Uh, what about antigens? Antigens uh, were uh, used uh, in other infection diseases, so we uh, are used to use it uh, to diagnosis of dengue or also in Ebola or also in HIV uh, infections. For SARS-CoV-2, the target is a nucleocapsid protein, and uh, the use of antigen tests in increase uh, together with the molecular diagnosis incre increase all the um, our power to diagnose to, to diagnostic for COVID uh, to find also hidden infections. The um, um, a very important uh, uh, aspect of antigen detections is that it could be automated with a high throughput workflow and uh, uh, not a very high TAT turnaround time. So it's very quick to, to have the result. Uh, we also can have uh, a lateral flow assay to uh, use as rapid test uh, that could be used in a specific situation when you have uh, high numbers and uh, of people which have to be uh, tested in a few minutes as in airport or uh, you need to use it in a self-test. So this uh, kind of diagnostics uh, works with uh, um, with POCT uh, or also in a lab version uh, has got um, um, less cost than molecular biology and is uh, really easy to perform. So if we want to uh, make uh, um, comparison between uh, RT-PCR and antigen test, what's uh, um, really evident is that the sensitivity is really different because RT-PCR uh, uh, tests are really sensitive uh, and the antigen test uh, moderate sensitivity. We can, we can uh, see something about that uh, 
later. And um, but uh, the complexity is really uh, different. So antigens is really use uh, easy to use. Uh, it's uh, also very fast uh, in uh, 15 minutes, uh, more or less, uh, you have the result uh, and uh, the cost of the test is low. Um, what are the difference in sensitivity? Sensitivity, there are many, many studies that uh, um, looked at the uh, frequency to test uh, our uh, the, the, the sensitivity could uh, um, could work better if you, um, so our test uh, uh, with a low sensitivity or a moderate sensitivity could work uh, better if you perform it uh, in a very, very, uh, with a very high frequency. And uh, this is the reason why in, uh, um, in many, many uh, setting uh, antigens were uh, used and uh, um, were used uh, um, over um, substitute uh, molecular testing. Um, many studies have been done and been, have been done uh, to look at the sensitivity and I just present one of these that uh, at the beginning uh, looks at the sensitivity of one antigen uh, system. Um, in our um, situation, we wanted a automated lab automated test with a high throughput. so we looked, at uh, antigen that were um, that were possible to do uh, in our hospital and centralized in uh, the lab, and um, we looked at the um, antigen uh, do with the li liaison Excel, uh, the instrument with we we have in our lab and uh, this study look at the sensitivity as you see the specific the specificity was uh, excellent and the sensitivity was correlated to the viral uh, present viral load. So uh, if uh, um, the sensitivity was in this study 73%, uh, but uh, um, for example, with uh, um, a CT value of uh, our RT-PCR below 30. Uh, in the same way, we looked at other studies, in a particular, uh, there were a multicentric Itali Italian study, uh, which um, looked at uh, the, um, pos the um, uh, capacity of uh, virus uh, replication and residual viral RNA in a patient with different kind of uh, CT level, so viral load. And uh, the conclusion of this study uh, that uh, involved uh, many Italian centers um, conclu conclude that uh, um, people are no longer contagious when the molecular diagnosis is based on high uh, CT value, more than uh, 35 uh, in one gene target uh, with uh, without clinical uh, data. So altogether, this information, so good uh, um, acceptable sensitivity and uh, with the uh, um, CT value um, around 30, um, determine the, um, uh, the change over the time of the use of the diagnostic test. So here you can see that in 2020, uh, all the diagnostic on COVID was performed on molecular test, but during these two years, uh, with the uh, assumption that uh, antigenic uh, test could work uh, well, um, during the time, some kind of population where um, um, we used uh, this kind of diagnostic, so antigenic test to, te to uh, see uh, if they were um, 
pyramid or no. So uh, at the beginning, uh, just uh, um, we work on uh, asymptomatic healthcare work screening. And uh, at the end, uh, so now, uh, we perform a lot of antigenic tests on our population or patients except frail patients, and we perform also the screening for admission to the hospital. So um, here you can see what happened on molecular testing in our, um, in our um, town. At the beginning, uh, we start with a very big effort because uh, there was a, uh, not a... Um, big molecular laboratory, but uh, uh, we made a lot of uh, effort to um, structurate it and to do about 7,000 tests uh, in a week. But uh, in January, we reach uh, 12,000 uh, for, for the wave of uh, uh, the winter of 21, uh, 2021. And on... Um, uh, on um, uh, July, uh, August, we reach a very enormous uh, uh, wave with more than uh, um, 26,000 um, samples, molecular tests uh, uh, done in, uh, in a week. But uh, now what happens, uh, the uh, waves and the problems with uh, admission and with the recovery of patients with COVID is um, quite uh, nice. So um, we reduce uh, incredibly the number of molecular testing, but in uh, the contrary, uh, the, what happens is that uh, uh, antigenic number of tests uh, grow up. At the beginning, uh, we choose to make uh, um, screening on healthcare workers because uh, we, um, as, uh, we there's some the assumption that uh, uh, all um, asymptomatic people could work, and we looked for the asymptomatic spreader. Then uh, we start with the uh, look also at the symptomatic uh, uh, patient with the programmed uh, admission. And now uh, we work uh, uh, um, mainly with the uh, antigenic test. Uh, um, we continue to screen our healthcare workers, but also we looked at uh, the admission patients. Um, each test, we choose each test looking at the, the European list of antigen tests certified and uh, no other test could uh, um, be done in the hospital uh, because we must uh, uh, test which have a, a clinical performance uh, proved uh, with the clinical studies. And uh, this is the last uh, upgraded list, uh, and uh, our uh, antigenic uh, test is also in this list. Um, what our um, uh, direction of the country said, uh, he said that the surveillance of asymptomatic healthcare workers, it could be done just with the antigenic test. Um, they divided our healthcare workers into a big group, one high risk area with uh, uh, the emergency room uh, pa um, uh, personnel uh, involved, also intensive care unit uh, uh, care workers. Um, I, can you see also very frail patient wards like oncology or hematology or transplant wards uh, are in these big groups. They uh, replay the nasopharyngeal swab each uh, 21 days, each three weeks. All the other part of the hospital is considered not high risk area and uh, the care um, workers uh, repeat uh, the swab each 30 days. This is the diagnostic workflow we used because uh, uh, we perform this uh, uh, chemiluminescence antigen test. 
uh, in asymptomatic uh, healthcare workers. If negative, they stop and could uh, continue to work. If the um, swab is positive, we confirm the positivity with RT-PCR. Um, what happened with the symptomatic one? Uh, they um, are um, they go to uh, the center of our surveillance of the hospital and they uh, perform a POCT antigen test. If it's positive, they stop and uh, go home. Uh, if uh, it's negative, they confirm it with the uh, PCR. Um, another way to use an uh, antigen test now is the um, emergency room, so the admission to the emergency room. This was the situation uh, until March 2022, where uh, all the patients went to the uh, emergency who, who need emergency room went to a very big area where uh, they wait uh, until they know the result of RT-PCR. Uh, the results were almost uh, um, mm, they, they have the result almost in uh, two hours. Uh, uh, um, when uh, the result was uh, uh, available, uh, they were um, oriented in the correct word or COVID negative or COVID uh, positive words. Now, since uh, April 2022, uh, we performed the POCT uh, at the emergency room uh, uh, area and uh, they after this 20 minutes uh, POCT uh, make the correct distribution of admission so for asymptomatic patients they replay every two days uh, the antigen test for the first week and then uh, if uh, um, the patient became symptomatic it go to RT-PCR. This is a graphic of our numbers. So if you see the blue line, it's uh, the molecular test. And uh, uh, since June uh, 2022, uh, can you see that decrease the number of the molecular test and uh, grow up the antigenic one as we expected with the re reduction of uh, cost and also of organization in our lab. What uh, about uh, uh, new variants? How uh, these new variants uh, can impact on a diagnosis? Uh, new variants are um, some uh, uh, recombination of uh, viruses that um, express in genetic lineage, uh, which are uh, monitored all in the world uh, through epidemiological investigation and uh, uh, also a surveillance on a genetic uh, uh, sequence uh, um, of the variant of the genome. So uh, the WHO um, defined a different type of variant, um, name, uh, identify the variant of concern, which are uh, the variant which can have uh, um, increased um, transmissibility and also a reduction in uh, um, neutral, neutralization by monoclonal antibody treatment and also which not respond to um, neutral, neutralizing antibody uh, we have with the vaccine, vaccine, vaccination. Uh, so is a is is a problem uh, on uh, the spread of this kind of variants. Uh, another kind of variants is the variants of interest, which have uh, specific genetic markers that uh, predict uh, um, uh, predicted how to um, affect uh, transmission, diagnostic, or can uh, have immune escape. Uh, this could uh, uh, cause also an uh, um, increase or another outbreak and um, 
are are going to to be um, at, to, to pay attention of the spreading of this virus. Uh, um, other variants uh, that could be um, monitored are the uh, variant that uh, the duped uh, ought has got a significant and sustained reduction in proportions over time, like Delta in our uh, um, last period. This is a temporal distribution of SARS-CoV-2 variants in the world and uh, also in Italy is uh, similar to other parts of, of, uh, of our globe. And uh, this is uh, our temporal distribution of different SARS-CoV-2 variants in Piacenza. We looked and sequenced the viruses along all the period until uh, since March, March 2021. And as you can see, there, there was the same distribution uh, during the time. And now we have 100% uh, of uh, Omicron in our country uh, with the 93% of uh, BA5 five, and uh, other BA4, BA2, uh, in uh, respectively uh, 4% and 2%. What about diagnostic test with uh, these variants? Uh, because uh, uh, we have to look at the, uh, uh, the efficacy of our diagnostic test uh, on what is uh, uh, spreading in our country. So uh, this is a work which uh, um, evidenced how uh, the, our test, our antigenic test, works with the uh, Omicron virus, which is the, the main one in our country. And um, it looked at um, uh, two periods, uh, as you can, you can see from this, uh, uh, this slide. Um, in, uh, it looked at two period swaps, one during the um, second pandemic wave, uh, during, uh, as you see, 2020, February 2021, and another wave from January to March 2022. Uh, is known that uh, Omicron um, variants was uh, going on. So um, they compare um, the, the result of uh, the antigenic liaison SARS-CoV-2 uh, antigen assay and uh, see that the overall sensitivity was the same. So the um, target, the nucleocapsid, was not affected by uh, the changing of the variants. Um, the sensitivity, the overall sensitivity was no so high because the uh, WHO asked a sensitivity of 80% to allow a test to be uh, used in hospital. Uh, this was lesser. And but uh, looking at the different sensitivity uh, on uh, uh, CT value, as we said, um, the, um, sens the sensitivity grow up uh, with the uh, CT value that are around 30 or lesser than 30. So it could be a nice test uh, to identify if uh, uh, people are spreading or not the viruses. And uh, also the, this study and this work uh, showed how if we changed the cutoff of positivity, uh, we can reach also a very high degree of uh, um, sensitivity, which increased to 88%. So you can manage uh, in your own uh, this kind of uh, information uh, to work and uh, uh, reach a better sensitivity uh, depends on your population. Uh, another works make the same uh, and compare the performance uh, of uh, the nucleocapsid protein uh, antigen of the um, 
the liaison essay um, and uh, looked at uh, sensitivity also with the, um, the performance of viral load and uh, say the same with the uh, CT lesser than 25, you have uh, around 90% of your sensitivity and 100% of specificity. So uh, the conclusion uh, of uh, all this uh, work, uh, also looking at the um, different uh, use of this test with different variants. Here they looked at alpha and beta variants and um, conclude that uh, uh, automatic tests uh, have uh, ad the advantages to be um, a good... Um, um, good level or sensitivity and also the advantage to high throughput screening possibility. So uh, if we want to look at the future, we can uh, have, uh, um, uh, 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 we have to look at the different uh, diagnostic tests uh, and uh, to keep uh, uh, consideration to the different use of uh, uh, the, uh, our diagnostic test and uh, our possibility. So if uh, uh, we, now we have uh, many um, molecular tests, not uh, viral tests, uh, which looks at the uh, RNA, viral RNA, and um, they have different kind of uh, um, possibility, um, uh, capacity to, um, to be sensitive. So we go to, uh, through um, different part of uh, uh, different uh, uh, condition of sensitivity. Uh, we can go through uh, 90 up to 90%. Uh, for um, very, very um, high CT, so uh, very high sensitivity, but uh, the, uh, in, a the, in the contrary, the problem is uh, how long uh, you can uh, uh, identify a patient as positive without any uh, pathology. And uh, we also have uh, antigen test, uh, which uh, can uh, have a uh, uh, high throughput if you use it in the laboratory. Uh, so you can centralize it. Uh, and uh, in uh, 18, 20 minutes, uh, you can uh, reach uh, uh, many people with um, good sensitivity just to look at the possibility to, uh, of the people to be the spreading of virus on. Uh, antigen test could be done also, as we said, with the point of care test, uh, like uh, lateral flow. And uh, we also have a very um, rapid test in uh, 15 minutes. Uh, each one can uh, uh, have the result. And also detection of uh, antibody to look at the positives. Now uh, many people are gone on vaccination so the antibody are used to uh, discriminate between uh, responders and non-responders uh, but the use is not so um, uh, is no is no uh, um, now uh, a high useful test uh, just for frail patients. Uh, in this work, uh, in this review, they um, uh, differentiate between situations. So this is what we have to do in our future to identify different kind of population or situation where to use uh, a different test and different diagnostic test. So if we have uh, symptomatic individuals, uh, we can uh, do uh, all the, the RT-PCR if we have the, possi the possibility, but we also can uh, do if uh, um, we want to discriminate between uh, respiratory uh, viruses, other uh, rapid uh, and uh, mixed uh, um, PCR looked at influenza or also um, respiratory syncytial viruses. 
and uh, we can go through the work uh, flow to uh, use the positive or negative uh, uh, result to to go in deep and make second level test in our uh, symptomatic patients. But uh, different is the um, use of tests on asymptomatic individuals, in particular if they uh, uh, have gone to assess to the healthcare, to the hospitals, where you can use uh, uh, antigenic tests as we do in Piacenza and uh, if they are negative, uh, leave the patients go on and uh, no more tests are needed. But if they are positive, you can go in deep and confirm it with a molecular test. Uh, other similar way to use the test is also for uh, the general population where you can have a single event where you need just to know if you are um, a, spreading a virus person and you can use also the rapid lateral flow test to be sure you are negative. Uh, what is going on on our future? Um, we are going to our winter season. So uh, there are many studies and uh, there is a concern about what happens in the other hemisphere about influenza. Uh, in Australia, they uh, see a very high number of uh, flu patients. And this is of concern because um, we estimate that the next winter, there could be uh, 10 or 10 to 60 percent of increase of uh, susceptibility uh, because uh, the lockdown limited the um, people have um, contact with influenza viruses. So this is the first winter we have uh, the probability to to reach uh, uh, and to to have contact with influenza viruses. So uh, the um, epidemic uh, could up. Up to it could be uh, important, and uh, uh, this is why we uh, started a very active program on influenza vaccination. Uh, but we have also um, the um, we have to improve our diagnostic test as we do here to um, explain to emergency room to. Um, to perform uh, um, another, a, stud, a complete study and uh, to look also if a symptom, if a symptomatic patients come to the emergency room to perform um, what we go what, what we call the surveillance of uh, influenza uh, all in all the country and uh, we looked uh, if there is a respiratory uh, symptoms uh, look at uh, COVID, uh, influenza, and RSV, um, RSV um, contemporary with mixed uh, uh, molecular testing. So I go to my uh, last uh, slide. Um, so we have we have to know that uh, now we have got many available tests and we have to use it according our epidemiological data and our logistic and, organi and hospital organization. Uh, we have to announce surveillance testing, especially in uh, uh, asymptomatic patients if they have contact with the hospital to reduce uh, the virus spreading and uh, this is uh, mandatory in healthcare workers and caregiver. Uh, we also need to differentiate uh, between uh, uh, respiratory syndromes, so between viruses, respiratory viruses. So we um, we um, strong. Uh, we want to um, uh, in, F, um, in, uh, 
perform many, many diagnostics in our future on differentiate between uh, this kind of viruses and uh, uh, to find if there will be mixed infections because this is the, um, the concern of uh, our government. Uh, we have also to look at the economic impact of the diagnostic workflow uh, because now we are paying a lot of uh, the, all the, the money we used for the outbreak in our country. So um, our chief and economical chief asked us to look at the, at the use of our um, economic resource. But we have to, to stop the molecular diagnostic because it's the base of uh, surveillance and also is mandatory uh, the use of molecular tests to monitor the emerging of uh, new variants. And uh, we ask gover our government to implement sequencing the capacity of our lab. I want to uh, thank uh, all the people who work uh, with uh, in, my, in my lab and uh, which um, uh, contrast <laughs> the spreading of the virus each day. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, which is your experience using saliva as a different matrix to detect SARS-CoV-2? I've got experience with a saliva matrix. Uh, we used it uh, especially for children at school to make surveillance uh, uh, in uh, Piacenza schools. But uh, uh, the uh, test worked well to find, uh, to, to reach and to find uh, negative, uh, uh, negative children, but uh, almost many, many of that were negatives, perhaps because the, the period was not, so, um, was not an epidemic period, so there were very few cases in Piacenza, so we uh, abandoned the use of a saliva test. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, how is your point of view on self-testing for SARS-CoV-2 detection? As we know, saliva self-testing uh, are no so sensitive uh, as uh, uh, laboratory. So I uh, ask people if it's possible to perform laboratory tests uh, because uh, there are many uh, issues on uh, self-testing that you have to, to, to think on. So uh, the, um, the system, if you, if you do your how self-test uh, is not uh, sure, you perform a correct test because you have to go uh, in deep your nose and this is no easy to do. Some other one have to, to, uh, to sample your nasopharyngeal uh, um, secretion. And, um, but uh, I know that uh, is uh, well, um, uh, is, is friendly used uh, at in-house, uh, this in-house test. So it is um, uh, very uh, easy and uh, friendly for people. So uh, you have to, to balance <laughs> this, uh, uh, this, this point. So uh, they are no so sensitive, but many people used and perform I hope, uh, and uh, self-isolation. Uh, uh, In my country, the government uh, um, uh, permit, uh, allow the um, um, registration of the result of the self-testing in uh, the database, uh, also to uh, count numbers of self-testing and uh, positive uh, 
people at home. So they uh, permit also the, the use of this, this test at home, but uh, I prefer lab test as I am a laboratorist. Great, thank you. And our final question for today is, how do you see the evolution of COVID-19 diagnosis? Uh, the evolution is straight uh, rapid, so um, I think we are going on an endemic uh, um, COVID, like like uh, other cold, like other coronaviruses. So the evolution of the diagnosis could be uh, related just on uh, symptomatic patients. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Juliana, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Daya Soren, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of your registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.